Good evening, everyone. We're going to start. Before we do, I want to just say, uh, my name's Gina Glickman. I'm the president at Massasoit Community College. And I want to, um, can I just have a show of hands of how many people are alums, students, some relationship, kids in college? Well, welcome back to campus. And for the rest of you who haven't been on campus before, welcome to Massasoit. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be able to host uh, this discussion tonight, and I, it's my job to introduce the moderator, Dr. Craig Andre. Um, he is the director of the Bureau of Family Health and Nutrition at, at uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and he is charged with improving the health and well-being of women, infants, children, and families. And previously, Dr. Andre was director of the Division of Health Access at the Department of Public Health and Associate Dean of Health and Wellness at Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. He's also served as a critical care and public health nurse at Boston Medical Center, as nurse manager and head athletic trainer at Buckingham, Brown, and Nichols School in Cambridge, Mass and owner and operator of Active Health, a private health and fitness company. Craig is a registered nurse, licensed athletic trainer, licensed massage therapist, I, I didn't know that part, okay, um, and strength and condition specialist with a master's and doctorate in public health from Boston University. We are also honored and proud that he was recently appointed as to the um, Board of Trustees for Massasoit Community College. So, Craig, welcome tonight. Introducing our candidates. Thank you so much. <laughs> All righty. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Let me introduce uh, our candidates today. Um, Mr. Robert Sullivan. and Mr. Jimmy Pereira. So before we get started, I want to do some housekeeping first um, to you all, the audience. Thank you for coming. This is such an important event and for you to be involved and be educated in a way that you can make informed decisions. It's a critical part of our society. Some, some rules of engagement. Um, we ask that you silence all your devices. Be sure to just check and be sure your phone is either turned off or is silenced. We're on um, at Brockton Public Access Television, and if your phone goes off, I'll point you out. <laughs> we want to create an environment that is open and um, respectful to be sure that we can um, learn all we can and all we need to um, find out here today. We ask you to be respectful um, with one another and with the candidates and with me. Uh, we ask that you refrain from applause. You can applaud in the beginning of the debate and at the end. Uh, lastly, I ask that you, uh, if you have a camera or a camera phone, please turn off the flash for the sake of our our photography and our cameras. For you, the candidates, uh, again, we, we are looking to learn all we can so we can make an informed decision as we possibly can. We ask you to be respectful uh, in speech and in behavior and to answer the questions asked by the moderator and panel as best as you possibly can. Um, regarding the format, we have several categories that we'll be going through throughout the debate. You'll first have an opportunity to provide some two-minute opening statements. I'll provide the first question, and then we'll go to our panel to be able to uh, go through these categories. There'll be times when you'll have an opportunity for a one-minute rebuttal, 
and I'll clarify if that is not the case. Any questions about that? No. So let me introduce our panel. <clears throat> Seated directly to my right is Jasmine Janes. Jasmine is a liberal arts We're already breaking the rules. <laughs> Jasmine is a liberal arts major at Massasoit Community College, where she is president of both the Gender Sexuality Alliance and Phi Theta Kappa. She is a lifelong resident of Brockton and graduate of Brockton High and graduated in Brockton High in 2018. Jasmine hopes to double major in political science and women's gender studies upon graduation from Massasoit. In her free time, she is an actress and has worked as a singing waitress since 2017. Next is Mark Lindy. Mark is... <clears throat> Mark LaRocque. Mark LaRocque. I'm sorry, they moved the categories here. My apologies. Um, Mark LaRocque has been a staff reporter at the Enterprise since 2015, covering news in the city, including the administrator of uh, the administration of former Mayor Bill Carpenter, city, state, and federal elections, city council meetings, and community events. Mark studied at the School of Journalism at Northeastern University, graduating in 2010 with a minor in Middle East Studies. No clapping, right. Dr. Ed Cabellan, is Vice President in, uh, for Student Services and Enrollment Management at Bristol Community College and an adjunct faculty member for the Higher Education Administration Matters Program and Caldwell University. He, is, he has uh, 20 plus years administrator and education primarily in Massachusetts public higher education and is a nationally recognized author, speaker, and consultant in organizational change student enrollment management, and digital technology. He earned his doctorate in education leadership at Johnson and Wales University, his master's at education and leadership in education leadership from Central Connecticut State University, and his bachelor's in communication from Stonehill College. Ed joined BAMSI's board of directors in December of 2018 and serves on the board for Coaching for Change. and Mark Lindy. It, Mark is the general manager for Brockton, Pub, Brockton Community Access, Brockton's nonprofit community television channel. He is also an adjunct professor at Massasoit Community College teaching public speaking and media <coughs> studies. Mark has extensive volunteer service in government having served formally as an election official as one of two representatives in Southeastern Regional School Committee uh, and chairman of Brockton Board of Library Trustees. He is a past president of two Rotary Clubs, Brockton and Rotary Club of Bridgewater. He is a community activist. Mark has a bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism and political science at University of Miami and a master's degree in media management from Fitchburg State. So each of you have two minutes to provide opening statements, and Mr. Sullivan, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank Massasoit and Bamsey for hosting, uh, and I also want to thank each and every one of you for coming here tonight. This is what Brockton's about. You're engaged, and you're interested in this election, November 5th. My name is Robert Sullivan, and I'm proud to stand here today as a candidate for mayor. For the last 14 years, I've served as a, served as a counselor at large for the city of Brockton, serving the entire city. Four times I've served as the council president. Today, as I stand, I, I am the council president. And last week, I was the acting mayor up until yesterday when Mayor Rodriguez was in Cape Verde. This election, in my humble opinion, is about experience, but it's about electing someone that's going to work for us, all of us in Brockton, inclusive, making sure that we have a safe community, make sure we have an economic thriving community, that we have a clean community. I think experience matters, and for 14 years, I've worked diligently for everybody, all segments, all populations, north, south, east, and west. 
and I'm humbly asking for your vote uh, at the end of the day. I'm from Brockton, my wife's from Brockton, I'm a graduate of the public schools here. I went to Boston College, I have a law degree and a business degree. It served me well 14 years, knowing how to do municipal finance and budgeting, drafting laws that help our seniors and our veterans. That's what it means to serve. I don't consider myself a politician. I'm a Brockton guy and I'm a public servant, trying to do the best for the people of Brockton. That's what you deserve. So on November 5th, when you go to the polls, remember, you're electing a mayor that's gonna be your voice, and I wanna be that voice. I wanna work extremely hard like I've done and continue to do that for everybody, everybody in Brockton. We need to be inclusive and we need to make sure that Brockton people are getting what they deserve, the voice at City Hall. I wanna thank you and I look forward to this evening. Thank you, thank you, sir. Mr. Pereira. Thank you, Mr. Andre. Good evening, Brockton. Thank you for the, uh, our hosts, our moderators, and the city of Brockton for coming out tonight. My name is Jimmy Pereira, candidate for mayor in the city of Champions. If I'm elected as your mayor, I will guarantee to work hard on holding the line on property taxes. Over the last four years, the city budget has increased over $100 million and rapidly approaching half a billion dollars. What have we gotten in return? Our tax rates are unsustainable. Both residents and small businesses are leaving our city every day. Our infrastructure is crumbling. Our crime rate is out of control. Nepotism and political deals have decimated our financial status, and the burden has been placed on our hardworking taxpayers' backs. We have a huge health care liability that the city has to fund through raising taxes every year. We have a dysfunctional alternative water supply plant that is costing the residents million, millions of dollars in increased water rates. Where do they don't even get the benefit of using the water? And we have about 50 pending discrimination lawsuits or more that could bankrupt our city finances and force us into receivership. My team and I have a $25 million saving costing plan that will help enable us to run the city going forward without the need to tax you to the full two and a half levy every single year. It's time for the elderly and those on limited incomes to be able to have a break, a long overdue tax break. As mayor, I would bring back the minimum job qualifications for city department heads who are responsible for the oversight of these millions of dollars. The established and the, the establishment chose not to vote for the minimum quali qualifications for department heads. We cannot continue with the same old, same old politics and backdoor deals. If elected, I will make sure to continue hiring the best person for the job and guarantee you that I will put an end to the racist practices of our past, which could bankrupt our city without a course of correction. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask for your vote on November 5th. We have and had enough of the establishment, enough of the old boy network, and enough of the status quo. It's time for change, the time is now. Thank you. Okay, I'll ask the first question. This is on leadership and qualifications. Mr. Sullivan, what qualities and qualifications do you have to be mayor of Brockton? Well, first of all, I'm not part of the old boys network, never have been, never will be. I think at the end of the day, it's, it's who I am. My legal training helps me, my business background helps me, um, but also being a good listener. You need to listen. I work in collaboration with other elected officials, local officials from the school committee to the city council to the mayor. The days of having barriers up those days are gone, ladies and gentlemen. We need to work together to move Brockton forward. So I can talk about my accomplishments and how long I've been here, but at the end of the day, it's what have I produced? What have I done to help Brockton from a fiscal responsibility standpoint? I have done it, and I'm gonna to continue to do it if I'm fortunate enough to be elected on November 5th. Thank you. Ms. Pereira, your qualities and qualifications, what do you have in them to be mayor of Brockton? Thank you. <clears throat> In my humble opinion, my experiences match the experience of the diverse city of Brockton. Growing up in a single mother household in the toughest neighborhoods, but also persevering and being resilient and going to Westfield State University where I focused on geography and regional planning, minored in ethnic and gender studies, solely so I can make sure I understand the fabric of our community, the diverse issues that we face. I have been working at the Old Colony Planning Council, which is the regional planning agency. We are an extension of the state uh, because of the Act of 1967, which mandated that each, each community uh, has to have a, a planner, uh, which we now have on Rob May, uh, but other communities can't afford one. So we are the liaison, and we make sure that we bring the funds to these communities, 
having that relationship not just with the local 17 municipalities, but also with our state delegation, nonprofit organizations, and other stakeholders in the community. But most important, my experience is with the people, the people of Brockton. And that's what we need as a candidate, as a mayor, someone that is relative, someone that has your experiences, but has also found solutions that they could bring to the table, innovative solutions. And that is the experience I bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lindy. This next category is economics, economic development and budget. Okay, so the question is directed to Mr. Sullivan first, and then a rebuttal from uh, Mr. Pereira. What is your position on offering tax increment exemptions or tax increment financing deals to businesses or developers interested in coming to the city? If you support these deals, is there a limit to them? If you don't support them, why not? So again, I, over 14 years, I've worked on 14 budgets, I've worked with four mayors, and the TIF program is a tool that you put in the toolbox for business development. We have used that to keep businesses here, like W.B. Mason. We've also used it collectively to bring businesses here, like Crown Linen, uh, Bernardi Auto, um, and, and, and other businesses in Brockton. You have to be selective when you use it, Mark, but at the end of the day, it's about trying to get it back on the tax roll, vacant buildings downtown. We've seen it as a catalyst for investment downtown, and that's what needs to happen. You don't do it across the board, but at the end of the day, it's using something as a tool and a mechanism that's gonna bring investment. Today, I went to Thorny Lee. They had the Metro South Real Estate Summit here in Brockton, and I listened to 15 developers. The BRA put out a, an RFQ. These people are investing in Brockton because of the tools and the offerings that Brockton is. Listen, it's a great place to live, work, and commute. So Brockton can be a wonderful place for investment. We've seen it, it needs to continue. That train that Mayor Carpenter started has to continue down the track, and ho I hope to be the cheerleader. I've done it for 14, and I'm gonna continue to do it if I'm fortunate enough, Mark. Thank you. Please. Uh, audience needs to be quiet, please. Mr. Pereira, you have a minute to answer the same question. Thank you. Um, from my observer, uh, observation and my uh, experience working uh, with the uh, local government municipality, uh, my opponent mentioned uh, you know, that train that has been moving forward, but time and time again, we've seen the obstruction put in front of that train, uh, especially with the uh, recent tiffs and ties uh, that were just uh, 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 basically revoked and uh, moved away. Uh, what we want to do is make sure that we're looking at incentives that are working for the people of Brockton. Uh, new businesses should be given tax relief when it benefits the residents of Brockton, but not at the expense of our residential taxpayers. Businesses that demonstrate their commitment to Brockton, prosperity and revitalization should be given a tax incentive when they hire locally, when they pay a living wage and provide better benefits. See, what I want to do is if there's a situation where the ties and the tiffs don't really relate to the community, we want to renegotiate and make sure we draw out what will work for the people of Brockton. When we give a tax break about 20, uh, about 20 years uh, that doesn't really bring money or forebears dollars to the community, it doesn't put us at an advantage. We want to look at other incentives like DIFs, which is the uh, district uh, incentives financing, which you, with our neighbor, neighborhood associations, we'll be able to look at other incentives that will grow our revenue sources. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Cabela. Mr. Pereira, what's your vision for the future of the former CSX Railroad property? How do you think the property should be used, and what should be the city's involvement? Great question. Uh, <clears throat> the state has first refusal for that property, so we need to make sure that we bring everybody to the table. Uh, we need to look at a coalition of organizers and also uh, community development corporations like NeighborWorks and other uh, initiatives that are going along with our city, uh, such as the uh, Urban Re Revitalization Plan. Uh, I worked on those plans. I'd like to uh, enlarge in the, uh, the, income, the, the district of that plan so we can include the CSX yard because it's not right now. Uh, and we want to look at relocating and working with uh, the, uh, in, in potentially putting uh, the uh, mainspring uh, shelter there, but reorganizing the, uh, the initiatives there also, looking at the holistic wraparound approach uh, where we would have have a mixture, mixed use of light industry, uh, but also have an apartment complex, cafeteria area where they would not just be fed but learn about nutritional values and maybe even culinary arts skills, uh, and also the uh, workshop area where they would receive mental health treatment, substance abuse uh, advice and treatment, and also workforce readiness preparedness and uh, job force training, and also financial literacy as well. Uh, we want to make sure that there's connections, there is a uh, train track there, uh, but also connections to the, uh, the uh, stops as well, the train stations, so we can make sure that we're having connections throughout the state. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're looking at, there's a brook there uh, 
and 20% of the uh, par property is uh, basically uh, not contaminated. It's able for, uh, there isn't any uh, need for environmental uh, studies. So we want to make sure that we can maybe look at residential uh, use as well. So a mixed use, creating maybe a village, but also making sure that we're looking at relocating and bringing more opportunities to that area so we could also open up more development for downtown Brockton. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan, one minute. So it's a privately owned uh, uh, vacant piece of land right now. Um, we would need to sit, out, sit down with all the stakeholders. City of Brockton does not have first right of refusal. Uh, but at the end of the day, it needs to be, uh, needs to be developed. It could be a solar bright field. Uh, these are some potentials. Uh, mixed use, housing. Um, and also, we did a 250,000 feasibility study. The city council appropriated it with the mayor. Uh, potentially, Chief, Williams from, uh, Chief Crowley from the police wants to put public safety building there. Chief Williams from the fire department thinks it's too far away from Route 24. Um, we need to do our due diligence on that. 21E contaminations are possible on that site as well. It's federally protected land because it's owned by a railroad station. Um, but it's in a really nice section of the city of Brockton for development. It's ripe. It was discussed today at that summit. Um, and, and I'm going to support the right development. But you can only have the right development by listening and working collaboration, getting ideas, sharing. That's what it means to be a servant and a public servant. And I hope to do that as the next mayor of Brockton if I'm fortunate enough. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rock. All right, this question uh, first for Robert Sullivan. Yes. As mayor, how do you plan on handling the $4 million Russell Lopes verdict in the upcoming class action trial that Lopes' attorney has pursued? suing the city on behalf of other minorities who were allegedly discriminated against when they applied for jobs at the Brockton DPW in the past. Will you consider settling these cases, or do you want them to be litigated further in court, potentially putting the city at risk of greater financial judgment against it? So I'm a lawyer, and I'm a member of the Massachusetts Bar, and uh, what I would do is I would sit down with the entities to discuss a possible settlement. There's nothing worse than discrimination. There's nothing worse. And as a citizen, we stand against all discrimination. As a lawyer, uh, and I've already met with Mayor Rodriguez about this, it needs to be discussed. The dollar amount that's laying out there right now, Mark, is just crippling. Um, but again, it's a meeting of the minds. It's his attorney and the city solicitor, Mr. Nazarella, sitting down to discuss it. But without the discussion, there's not going to be any movement. Um, we have learned from past practices, and those days are gone. And if I'm elected mayor, I'm going to make sure everyone's voice is heard. And the discrimination days, they, they're long gone. They have to be. It's not right to move Brockton forward. But this Lopes case right now is a pending matter, and it needs to be vetted out and reviewed. And I'm going to be a strong advocate to work with Mayor Rodriguez just to do that. And one minute, uh, Mr. Pereira, a response? I have uh, talked to many people uh, that's uh, involved around the uh, lawsuit case, and, and it's in my humble opinion that the city should, should settle for the case before the trial. Uh, to be honest, we will most likely lose the case because uh, we've seen the issues not just here but uh, nationally as well in the case of discrimination. And ignoring this case would be a disservice to the city of Brockton and to the taxpayers. So I would make sure to work, sit down, and make sure to listen uh, and provide feedback as to how we can move this forward and make sure that we uh, do what's best for the city of Brockton and for Lopes as well too for his uh, 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 troubles and make sure that we change the practices and, and work with Sandra Knight and the uh, personnel department but also create a citizens advisory committee so there's more public feedback community input onto the hiring and firing practices and also disciplinary action that should be considered when dealing with situations as this. Mr. Pereira, what is your vision for Massasoit Community College in the downtown area? Great question. I would definitely have, and I would, uh, if elected mayor, if I'm, uh, if I have the pleasure to, to be elected as mayor, I would work with the parties that be, whether it be the state uh, and the uh, local organizations, to really recant and look at how we can uh, bring forth the downtown education collaborative. We've seen it work in many different municipalities, like Springfield, like Boston as well, uh, and we know that we need to bring more foot traffic to the downtown city of Brockton. But we also want to make sure that it's safe for our community residents. As a planner, we look at the multifaceted approach, the problem-oriented approach. Identify the problems, bring forth the solutions. When you go to downtown, there's not really much for you to do. Uh, it closes out down at 5 p.m. Uh, there's also also been uh, pedestrian uh, fatalities there uh, at Legion Parkway and Main Street. So we need to make sure that when we're looking at two-way Main Street, we are going to open the door for opportunities such as new development, like a place for the Massasoit and other education collaboratives, but also make sure there are functional attributes so that when students go, faculty go to a downtown or a downtown education collaborative, there will be things for them to do uh, on their downtown, places for them to study, like a Starbucks, 
place maybe uh, in downtown Brockton, or uh, cafes like Averos Cafe, who I uh, frequent for the uh, salted caramel coffee there. Uh, but uh, these are the things that we want to do. And from my insight as a planner, as a, par uh, as a uh, public servant, and as a Brocktonian, these are the things that I want to bring forth and have sat at the table and designing these uh, policies and plans to make sure that we can make this happen. Mr. Sullivan, you have one minute. So I'm the son of an educator at Brockton High. Education's always been paramount, um, and it's important. Uh, and, and I'd like to see Brockton replicate what Fitchburg State's done, what Haverhill's done, what UMass, UMass Lowell's done. Um, development downtown in the College Collaborative, when Governor Patrick gave us the bond, I supported it. And then Governor Baker came in and cut that. Um, we need to get that back on track. That needs to happen. It's going to be good for Massasoit and the students and the teachers and the educators here, but it's going to be good for the development downtown. We're a commuter, really great gateway city, and it's, it's 35 minutes downtown. So it doesn't have to be just Brockton students that would come to matriculate to Massasoit. It could be people from Quincy, people from Boston. That's the beautiful aspects of Brockton. So I would support it wholeheartedly. We've got to get it back on track, working with the state reps and the state senator to make sure that the governor and lieutenant governor understand how necessary it is in the downtown college collaborative initiative. Thank you. Mr. Lindy. Uh, this question is for Robert Sullivan. First, what should be the future of Campanelli Stadium and the Shaw Center, given public discussion in the past by the city council about what the city could do with the building once its lease has expired? So I said this the other day at another forum that Jimmy and I were at. It's a city asset, right? And so if your home, your front steps of your home need repair, you hire a mason. If your pipes are done, you get a plumber. We need to invest the money. It's a city asset. Now it's brought back into the confines of the city of Brockton. City Council helped do that. B21, Brockton 21st, doesn't control that anymore. It's an asset that we need to put money into because right now, the days of having concerts up there with Bob Dylan and Willie Nelson and Brian Epps, those days are gone. Um, the days of having great venues there. Um, Chris English is still the owner of The Rocks. He's from Milton, he's a, an investment guy. Um, he's had meetings with us, and I know that the mayor and the city council want to get that back on track. It has to. Right now, it's great that it's there, but it's not being utilized. We need to maximize the benefit. That's why it happened in the first, it was great the first couple of years, Mark, but because of disrepair and sloppiness and mismanagement, it fell to disrepair. We need to make sure that we put the money in, that we can maximize the benefit, Right now, the Brockton High baseball team plays there, but we can do better. That's a great, but we need to add from an addition standpoint on that, Mark. Okay. Mr. Pereira? Thank you. In the re, uh, regards to the Campanelli Stadium, I would first advocate for a feasibility study, uh, basically look at a SWOT analysis, look at the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and threats that face the uh, Campanelli Stadium. I would like to uh, prefer to keep it public and known by the city, but ensure we invest and market the property so that it's successful in the future, just as we did with the golf course, which is recently brought a little bit over $1.1 million. Uh, we also want to make sure that there's linkage programs, uh, not just with other private uh, businesses coming in or private uh, public relationships, but also with the school system. So having a culinary arts program, uh, which has uh, been talked about as well uh, and implemented, but also looking at other marketing uh, pro opportunities for students as well, uh, and also sports and athletics included. Thank you. Thank you. I yield my Dr. time. Dr. Cabella. Mr. Pereira, do you support making Main Street a two-way road? In the development of downtown, is making Main Street two-way a sound model for walkability, bike lanes, in a modern, thriving downtown area. So I could talk about this for about days, three years, however long you want to go, because this is uh, my bread and butter. This is what I focus on, is community, network, community building, and advocacy for the betterment of public good. Uh, this is what I studied. This is what I've been doing for over half a decade at the Regional Planning Agency, working for you, Brockton, uh, and advocating for the greater Brockton area. It is a great uh, opportunity. It's something that has been talked about for uh, 14, 15, 20 years uh, by the establishment and hasn't really been moving forward. Uh, what we need is a mayor that's going to stand up, stand strong, and advocate for these projects that are going to make Brockton better uh, with, and explain to the community and educate the community of the benefits and make sure it's clear that it's not just Main Street. It's the neighboring networks that go along with Main Street. Your Warren Aves, your Spring Street, where you have the homeless epidemic and the opioid abuse right in front of you. And mind you, I live on North Warren Avenue, so on my way to Old County Planning Council, I either walk, bike, bus, or drive through the issues that we see day in and day out. By fixing Main Street, you create a, an environment where there is no more of the no man's land, no more of the brick broken windows effect. You drive down the streets and there's potholes the size of 
Don't know what, and we'll leave it at that. But know that because of these issues, people feel deplored, they feel downtrodden. Uh, so with this uh, initiative, we'd make sure that we're inclusive, bringing all the stakeholders to the table and making sure that it's a reality, not just a study that's gonna sit on the shelf as it has done for over decades. Thank you, and I yield my time. Adam. Mr. Sullivan. Yes, Doctor, I think we need to do that, and I'll tell you why. Because in 2006, I brought forward Chapter 40 of Smart Growth Zoning. And I said at that time to my colleagues, it's going to be a catalyst for investment. We're going to have five zones in the core of the city, and we're going to bring back some investment. And you know what? It came to reality. That's why Vincentes did the natural expansion of the old style market. That's why there's a $30 million investment downtown from Trinity Financial. That's why the Kresge building is going to be totally built from, from the, the bottom up. Um, so I think if we don't do that, it's short-sighted. The developers that I've spoken to over 14 years on the city council have asked, why isn't it? and it needs to come to fruition. Senator Brady had a bond that came out uh, from the State House. We need to maximize that. We need to maximize that. Because if we don't, we're losing investment. And our tax base needs to increase because that's gonna help everybody. With our taxes increasing, we're gonna hire more police, more fire, more teachers, fix our roadways. So that's something I would support 100%. Thank you. Thank you. The next category is public health and health care. Mr. Sullivan. Yes, sir. Given the recre that recreational marijuana sales are expected to come to Brockton. How would you as mayor balance the benefits of business opportunity with the risks of public health? So uh, again, I've chaired the city council ordinance committee for many, many years of my 14 years. Um, and I, I got bashed by a lot of people saying maybe I, I dragged my feet on the marijuana zoning. Uh, I think I did the right thing. Daughter of the I's, cross the T's, protected our community. Um, I don't think it's gonna be the windfall of money I think it's gonna be first in, first out. It's gonna get saturated. But I do know from a healthcare perspective, and my wife is a PA, my mom's a nurse, we need to look at the ramifications. Right now, we're seeing the vape, and the governor, to his credit, did the vaping. Uh, there's deaths right now. I think we need to look at a cross approach where we have the great, Greater Brockton Health Alliance that we could utilize. You know, I'm the chairman of the board, a volunteer of Good Samaritan Medical Center. So we have Good Sam, we have Signature, we have the VA, Brockton Neighborhood Health Center. We need to get all the people together to figure out what are the ramifications. Now, it will increase our tax base, that's a certainty, but what's the long-term effects? We've seen this right now with vaping. What's gonna happen with marijuana? It's the unknown. I mean, you could talk to one doctor who's gonna tell you different than another doctor. But I do know from a community perspective, and as a dad of three kids, I wanna make sure we do it the right way. I wanna make sure we have a safe, healthy community. That's what it means to be a leader at City Hall, to be a vocal leader to not just do what people want you to do, to do the right thing. It's how I was born and raised, and that's what I'll do, win or lose. Always do the right thing. Thank you. One minute rebuttal, Mr. Brewer. Thank you. It is great that uh, we know that uh, you know, the ordinances have been filed out, but we've seen a lot of issues with the application process. Uh, we want to make sure that when we spend $80,000 on a website, that we also make sure that we update the information provided to the public. Uh, we want to make sure that we're cost effective and making sure that the public knows what the policies are and what not to do as well. Uh, if elected mayor, I'd make sure to open the door and open up the books to make sure that people know what is supposed to happen and what is not supposed to happen with this new law. Uh, we know that it's not just recreation, it's medical also benefits that come along with it, but we cannot be short-sighted because the state is already looking at uh, ordinances and legislation uh, for marijuana cafes, where you have marijuana infused with food also, uh, which we want to make sure that people are, again, educated on what the casualties or possibilities can be if someone uh, walks into the establishment and is not sure that uh, there's uh, marijuana infused food. So education is a big part of these new practices and policies that are being put in place. And we want to make sure, as I've always said, to measure twice and cut once, because we do not want mistakes. Thank you. Mr. Lent, ready? This question is for Mr. Pereira. Brockton has been poised now for three years to fluoridate its water. In the context of significant numbers of Brockton residents not having access to dental health care, would you approve of Brockton fluoridating its water, and what's your perspective on this issue? 
it's something that we haven't, I haven't reviewed too much upon. I have lived in communities where the water has been fluoridated and it hasn't been any uh, issues to that, but I would like to make sure that we bring all stakeholders to the table, uh, especially when we're looking at where the water is coming from as well, whether it be Silver Lake or the desalinization plant or any, any other uh, resources that we may one day connect to. Uh, we want to make sure that we're doing something that's not going to uh, affect any of our children or in our, in our communities. So I think we'd have to look at a, a health assessment study before we uh, move forward with any uh, change to our water uh, infrastructure and water provide uh, uh, provision to the uh, community as well. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. One minute. Yeah, absolutely. We want to promote health uh, in our community, right, and, and battle disease. I've spoken to dentists, uh, dentist, and uh, I know it came before the city council on a resolution that was filed. The late Board of Health Director Luke Tataglia came and we supported it. It needs to be done. If you look at other communities, it's just a matter of course. And, uh, you know, when we're talking about the youth, and that's what's going to benefit, the young. Um, and, and it's not happening. And it's really kind of mind-boggling why it's not. Um, and again, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected by the voters of Brockton, it has to be because other communities that surround us are doing it. And the fact that we're not doing it is quite honestly just not the right thing. So I would support that, Mark, 100%. Thank you. Dr. Cabello. Mr. Sullivan. Our aging population is going to require significant health care services moving forward. How would you address this concern as mayor, and what is, the vision, what is your vision for the future of Brockton's Council on Aging? Well, first of all, my mom and dad are here, and they're on a fixed income, and they're retirees. Um, and one thing that I did as a city councilor is I drafted an ordinance to take care of our seniors, to take care of our veterans. They're the most vulnerable. None of us would be here uh, without the seniors and the vets. And I filed an ordinance to say, hey, listen, a lot of these folks are on fixed incomes having a tough time, right? Having a tough time trying to pay their taxes. So they volunteer time in the city of Brockton by this ordinance, and they get a price reduction on the real estate taxes. I understand that we have an aging population, but we also have to appreciate and thank that population. And the best way to thank them is to not forget them to make sure that elected officials honor them, do the right thing. And that goes working with the federal government right now and looking at our housing authority complexes. They need to be rehabbed. They're not in the best condition. We need to make sure that our seniors, first of all, feel safe, feel protected, feel loved, feel welcomed, and they're listened to because they are invaluable. They can provide us the guidance that we need to move Brockton forward. So I think that's a great, thank you for that question. You're welcome. Let me ask you a follow-up yes, question. Sir. So part of the challenge here, and this is happening across Massachusetts and across the country, aging population and a, and a workforce that isn't ready um, or uh, we don't have them in the numbers in terms of nurses aides and, and, and nurses and other clinicians to be able to care for the aging population. As Mayor of Brockton, what would you do for that? Well, I would look at, first of all, I would, I would do a community engagement meeting and I would sit down with the, the profits, the nonprofits, the private entities, the healthcare facilities, and this is right up your skill set. You'd be invited to the table. And I would, I would say, hey, listen, let's not think outside the box. Let's get all the different skill sets and experiences together to figure out, number one, how can we benefit it in a timely manner, because talk is cheap. You need to address it. It's not a cure that can be done overnight, but without communi communication and the collaboration and the expertise at a table discussing an important topic, it can't be achieved. So I would do that. I would welcome it. And actually, I'm not trained in the healthcare, and I'm not quite a senior yet. I'll be 50 this year, but it needs to be done. And again, it needs to be done collectively. Mr. Perrault? Yes. So we always look at the aging uh, population or aging in place model to make sure that our elderly feel comfortable, safe, and welcome in our uh, communities. Brockton isn't much so. We have an elderly abuse situation, uh, whether you're looking at all our diverse backgrounds, people from different communities, different uh, countries come to this country uh, and look to live here and age here as well. Uh, we also look at the functional attributes that aren't here in the city of Brockton. Safe sidewalks, safe streets, safe in infrastructure. Whether we're working with the local municipality, the regional uh, government, state and federal, we need to make sure that the elderly community are at the table at all times. I want to create and establish a seniors commission, uh, which you see one in Stoughton and neighboring communities. We don't have one in the city of Brockton. We need one. We need collaboration with our youth community as well. There is a volunteering program now that if a uh, elderly person uh, can't shovel their yard, then uh, the city would send a volunteer there. We need to make sure that we invigorate that opportunity and bring that connection and make sure that our elderly community continue to feel welcome in the city of Brockton. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Lorac. Mr. Pereira, what do you think are the city's top public health priorities and how would you respond to them as mayor? 
There's a list of them, uh, and I could, uh, you know, again, sit at the podium and tell you, uh, you know, whether it be the opioid abuse, the youth gun violence, the domestic violence here in the city of Brockton. Uh, as a public servant, as a professional planner, we look at the multifaceted approach. Everything is interconnected with each other. Uh, we need, as a, an elected official that knows the issues that our community faces, my mom uh, went through the immigration process, and through that issue at time, she felt that you know she couldn't call the police officers when her husband was beating on her because she wasn't sure if uh, they would uh, uh, ask her for her status as she went through the uh, process of receiving her green card and finally her citizenship. Uh, we've seen. Time and time again, I've lost friends to gun violence. This year, I've lost one. I'm lucky if I don't lose another one. Uh, and this has happened uh, ever since, again, growing up in the city of Brockton. We need to make sure that there's more mentorship programs for our youth. We need to make sure that there's a safer streets, having a Vision Zero policy. Uh, what that means is basically we would make sure to focus on implementing traffic calming devices and new policies that will stop and prevent people from being killed on our roads. Enough is enough. God forbid a child leaving from school walks into the crosswalk and gets ran over by a car because there's too many cars parked close to the crosswalk. We need to make sure that we're enforcing the laws that are on the books by educating our police officers, but also educating our community members to know that this is what needs to be done. We have a very diverse community. Some don't speak or read English. Some don't even speak or read, uh, don't read their own languages. So we need to make sure we're looking at other ways to educate our community, whether it be visually, audible uh, uh, education as well, whether it be through the radio or other methods to make sure that people know what the rules, regulations, and expectations of the city of Brockton are. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan, one minute for this question, please. So, Mark, there's a direct correlation between drug abuse and crime. Uh, that's clear and that's proven. Uh, I think what we would need to do as a community leader is make sure that we continue the champion plan that was initiated by Bill Carpenter that is actually nationally recognized right now and also enhance that. I've talked about it before. Brockton right now has wonderful health care facilities, but we need to educate. We have a new interim superintendent, Mike Thomas. We need to get all the factors together to make sure that we educate the youth. When I was a kid at Brockton High, it was students against driving drunk. Those days are gone. Now it's opiate addiction, both, uh, both illegal and legal drugs. People are dying. People are creating criminal activity because of that. There's also a root cause of homelessness. So we need to kind of do a, a, an approach that addresses all these issues to make sure that Brockton is a safe community. And it also goes back to a clean community, the code enforcement that's on the books that's not being addressed. So it's quality of life issues, but it does come back to crime, drugs, and public safety. If I'm elected mayor, I'm gonna support what Mayor Bloomberg and Mayor Menino did, and I'm gonna join the Mayor's Coalition Against Gun Violence. It's never been done in the city of Brockton, and I would be echoing the sentiments of what Mayor Menino and Bloomberg did. It's gonna save lives down the line. Ms. Jane? At last count, this is Jimmy Pereira. At last count, 18.6% of all people in the city of Brockton were under the federal poverty level. As mayor, what would your plans be to address issues of poverty, housing, food insecurity, and homelessness? Thank you for this wonderful question. Uh, one that actually has affected me growing up in the city of Brockton. I grew up under that poverty line, a uh, single mother uh, working two, three jobs to uh, put food on the table uh, and raise uh, three, two, three children, uh, one born and raised here. I was born here, but my two uh, siblings were born in uh, Cave Verde and came here at the age of 13 and 14, not knowing the city uh, the, uh, or the uh, country and uh, what to expect. So we want to make sure that we're looking again at the multifaceted approach food policy that's going to look at the food deserts and make sure that we deplete that uh, gap and make sure that every corner of the city, someone has access to fresh food. So working with our neighboring communities and increase the uh, capacity for our farmer's market and make sure that we're looking at organizations that's, that are doing it now, like People Affecting Community Change, PAC, uh, led by Jamal Gooding. Uh, we also want to make sure that there's more economic opportunities, equitable economic opportunities, community reentry programs for those that are uh, coming back home uh, from uh, whether it be uh, incarcerated or doing uh, time in jail. Uh, we've seen that with the uh, Plymouth District Attorney's Office and the uh, Corey Friendly uh, Job uh, uh, program that's uh, been held at the, the uh, uh, cafe at the uh, uh, Shaw Center as well. Uh, and again, making sure that we look at how we're going to bring more innovative businesses to the city of Brockton to widen the commercial tax base and alleviate pressure on homeowners and renters as well because when your taxes go up, your rent goes up. Uh, and everything is interconnected again. And through my experience as a regional planner, looking at the multifaceted approach, we need to make sure 
sure that we're tackling these issues from all different angles. And the only way we can get there is having someone that's academically prepared for this situation, that's professionally ex uh, prepared for this ex experience and uh, situation, and also personally experience the same issues that continue to thrive in this community today. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. In the year 2017, one out of 12 children uh, lived in poverty, and that's unacceptable. Um, every student in the Brockton Public Schools is qualification for free lunch. We need to look at the social agencies, such as the Charity Guild, that provides daily lunch. We need to come together as a community, because we're not a wealthy community. We're not Wellesley. We're Brockton, and it's the best thing to be Brockton. But we have to understand that it's a reality. People are living day to day, paycheck to paycheck. And, and I realize that because I get calls from constituents saying, hey, do I buy my, my meds or do I pay my rent? I mean, that's just reality. So we need to do better as elected officials, as citizens, but I also think we have to look at the root cause, right? We need to provide high care, learning experiences, you know, working in collaboration. That's the way. We're never going to end poverty. I mean, that's just not going to happen, but we can try to mitigate it and try to minimize it and make sure that the Brockton people that live here get the needs that they get. And, and again, again, I said it to, to Dr. It's not a cure overnight, but without talking and without discussing everybody, that's how we can achieve it. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan, as mayor, how would you respond to the opioid crisis and behavioral health problems that remain ongoing challenges in the region? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, again, as a dad of three young kids, it's, it's a scary proposition. I had never heard of a Skittles party. Skittles was candy to me. But what it is is kids showing up, throwing different colored pills into a, into a bowl and popping them. I mean, it's just scary times right now. So I think what we need to do is we need to speak with our health professionals, the experts, and also right now the champion plan, I mentioned it before, it's, it's something that's making a difference in people's lives, right? So we have to figure out if there's a root cause of a drug addiction, could, could be anything. Someone that got injured, someone you know that got hooked up on Oxycontin and now is on heroin. We need to figure out a compassionate approach, but also a personal approach. How do we address it? And as chairman of the board at Good Samaritan, I had a meeting last night. We talk about this on a regular basis because it needs to be addressed. But again, I, I see it as a collaborative approach with healthcare professionals, with the educators in the school system, with the elected officials, but also with just Brockton people, because people are dying, young and old, white and black, they're dying. And we need to figure out as a community how to try to address it the best possible way, but also in a timely manner, because it's, it's too precious not to. Mr. Pereira? Yes. <clears throat> I will continue to work on the uh, opioid epidemic, working on the opioid epidemic, uh, and make sure that we not just continue with the champion plan, but ex expand it as the mayor uh, Carpenter plan to. Uh, I've lost friends to the opioid abuse. I've lost <coughs> friends to uh, drugs and guns as well too. Uh, whether you're looking at heroin, uh, lean, uh, which is a cough medicine mixed with soda, uh, or also looking at marijuana that has been infused with the. Uh, with fentanyl, exactly. Marijuana that has been infused with fentanyl and other hard <coughs> drugs like uh, sentinel as well too. Uh, times are changing, drugs are getting stronger, and they're getting even more fatal at a rapid rate. So we need someone that has been there, uh, that has been involved with making sure to help those that are uh, going through addiction. Uh, not too long ago, I was uh, with a close friend and we went to Spring Street to get his relative, uh, a close friend that was like a relative, out of that situation. Three o'clock in the morning, uh, he called me, and as uh, soon as I found out where he was, I went there uh, in, in a haste uh, because that's not a place for you to be. At the age of 12, my mom didn't know this, and if she knew me, I think uh, she'd probably pull my ear a little bit harder, but uh, at that age, I walked from uh, uh, West Chestnut all the way up to uh, Roosevelt Heights, where my mom lived, uh, and I walked right past Spring Street. Uh, I've seen things and continue to see things that still continue to be here in the city of Brockton, and we need to make change, and I'll continue to work on that. Thank you. The next category is public safety. Mr. Lindy. So this question is for Robert Sullivan first. What is your stance on the Brockton United Ordinance that was voted down by the City Council, which was called a piece of sanctuary city legislation by former Mayor Bill Carpenter? So I chaired the Ordinance Committee, Mark, and we had four or five meetings, and people that were in favor of it, two of my colleagues on the City Council put it forward, and people that were opposed. We had the DA there, we had uh, proponents, citizens, um, and at the end of the day, our attorney, we have a legislative council, and also the city attorney said that Section C of that violated federal law. I'm a lawyer, 
I abide by the law as a city council every two years. I pledge to the Constitution. I will never support anything that's unlawful. But also, if it was passed, it would have had harmful impact on our financial ability, our federal grant funding. It would have put the police in a precarious situation. So I, if I'm elected mayor, I won't support anything that's going to harm Brockton and be unlawful. But I also said this that night at the city council chambers. We need to come together as a community. There was a reason why Moses and Gene put that forward. We need to have open communication. We need to make sure that there's a better connection with the police and the citizens. And, and that's just a reality. People are afraid right now to report crimes. That should never happen. But what I will say is that the DA and the police chief said they have never called ICE on anybody. They just haven't had to do that. They haven't had, that's what they, that's what they opine to us. So what I will tell you is I voted twice against it. It came out unfavorable four to one, and it did not pass through a third reading. It failed eight to three. So you see these signs, stop Sanctuary City. Well, it's already been stopped at the city council level. It didn't pass under Robert's rule, under the procedures. So um, I do think that we, as a community, need to come together to talk more. And that comes by electing the right people, from the mayor to the city council to the school committee, to making sure that everybody, everybody that's here on Washington TV feels that their voice is being heard. And that's why I'm running for mayor, Mark, making sure that people feel like they're getting the representation when they go to the polls to vote. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pereira. Thank you. Uh, I think Brockton, uh, whether it be fortune or unfortunate, will never be a sanctuary city. Uh, this is a dead issue. Uh, this issue, uh, the uh, sanctuary city thing is over. It was actually called the Brockton United Ordinance. Uh, I believe we need better community policing and better community engagement to strengthen the relationship between immigrants and our local authorities uh, because, you know, we've been very reactive. It's time to be proactive. The ordinance did it pass, but the problem still exists where community members don't feel comfortable engaging or calling police officers because they're not certain what the repercussions will be. We need to make sure that they know that there won't be any repercussions. When you are in the unknown, you are uncomfortable and you do not know what to do in time of needs. We need to make sure that people are taken out of that situation and know that we are here to work for the betterment of the community. Uh, there are federal guidelines that we're not using now, which says that if you have a population or community uh, from a different, uh, that, that's limited English proficiency, you need to provide interpretive and translative services to that community, no matter what the legal status, race, origin, or uh, other civil rights uh, protected classes are. Uh, we we need to make sure that we're following those title guidelines because we're not doing it now. Uh, we need to make sure that we're working with police officers that are working with these communities now, like Lisa Fonts, like Nancy, uh, and more officers that are, again, tackling the problem every day, people that I have engaged. I get calls and I engage with people that, you know, I won't, you know, divulge any information, but it's troublesome to know what these families are continuing to go through, and it's time, time for change. Thank you. Dr. Capella. Mr. Pereira, as mayor, you would be overseeing the appointment of our chief of police. What are the qualities and qualifications you would look for in Brockton's chief of police? Great question. Knowing the fabric of our community, uh, I would like to uh, have a police chief that knows the community, that is able to engage and relate to the city of Brockton and the diverse community that we have. Uh, we want to look at new innovative practices that will be implemented and accepted uh, by the chief of police. I would like to look at someone that has been in the community also, uh, someone that again knows the fabric of the community, but make sure that we open up for opportunities for a nationwide search as well, uh, because you never know what you can find once you open those doors. Uh, and it's something that we've seen by uh, people moving in from Boston and moving in from other cities around the country as well. Uh, so again, we need to make sure that we're looking at someone that's going to be well invested into the city of Brockton, that's not going to look for a stepping ladder or a stepping stone uh, to further their career other than making sure that Brockton is a better place. Of course we want people to advance, but we want them to make sure that Brockton is a priority in first and before that advancement. Uh, we've seen issues at the high school where there has been conflict between police officers and our youth. Uh, again, when police officers know who the community members are and the community members know who the police officers are, there's a stronger sense of respect and a stronger a sense of responsibility and communication to work for the people of Brockton, but also for the people of Brockton to understand what it means and takes to be a police officer. Uh, we want to continue with the uh, Young Police Academy that has uh, been implemented. Uh, we also want to look at other opportunities for our other uh, first response teams, such as our firefighters and also the EMT, uh, whether it be Brewster or any other agency that wants to work with the city of Brockton. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. I would hire a department head, first of all, that has the experience, the expertise, the respect of peers, and also someone that has the dedication. Um, I'm not a police officer, I don't have that calling in life, uh, but we have great men and women in blue that put their lives on the line. 
but I think when the mayor comes in, whoever that is, um, they need to figure out from a personnel perspective, not just the police chief, but all different department heads. And again, you need to look at almost like an audit perspective and see, you know, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses? And also, how are we gonna move to, together as a community? You know, we need to hire more police, that's a fact, and I will do that. Walking beats, community policing, making sure that the community feels that the police or fire or DPW or building reflects them. Um, Multi-languages is important in this society, it has to be. So if I'm asked this question, who would I hire? I don't know what man or woman it would be hired to lead the department, but it would be the most qualified, respected, and someone that can lead a department going forward in a bright, bright way that everybody feels comfortable about. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Laura. To Mr. Sullivan, uh, traffic and road conditions are two areas of concern, according to many motorists who have traveled the city. What would be your plan to address these areas? So we all know the tragedy of Mr. Yancey being killed on Belmont Street 123. Just walking across the street, he was killed. And I filed, a, and it's still unsolved, an unsolved homicide, murder. Uh, and, and, we, and we feel for his family. I filed a resolution right after that to say, hey, listen, let's lower the speed limit. Let's lower the speed limit. When I was a town attorney for five years in Randolph, we did it in Randolph. Why can't we do it in Brockton? To my amazement, when the state officials came down, they said to me, well, you know, it'd be too expensive to change the, the, the signs, the speed limit signs. You don't put a price on someone's health and safety. So we need to look at collectively, holistically, the, the road conditions, making sure that Brockton's getting its fair chapter 90 funds, which I don't believe we are, and also making sure that private roads that are turned to public, we get our chapter 90 reimbursement on that, and also that we work together collectively, because right now, and Jimmy said it earlier, people are being hit, motorists, and also bicyclists and pedestrians. And we cannot, as elected officials, we can't stand for that. So we need to be strong from a community standpoint, a public safety standpoint, but also from a common sense standpoint. If you can lower a speed limit in Randolph, you can do it in Brockton, and it's gonna save lives. That's just a fact. So, um, you know, if I am elected, again, the mayor is the CEO, the administrator of a business known as Brockton, $440 million business, not the legislative body, which is the city council, but you need to work in collaboration. City councilors would have to draft ordinances. I've done that for 14 years, and the mayor would have to work with the city council to initiate it. And that goes back to working with the state delegation, the three state reps and the senator that, that represent Brockton, and say, hey, listen, this is a mechanism that could go on the books immediately after three readings under Robert's rules, and then it's gonna save lives. So it's short-sighted not to do it, and I would be an advocate for that. It makes sense, common sense. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Sure. So on the other side of this, it is about finding ways to, uh, to structurally change our roadways that make it more bike friendly and pedestrian friendly. Is there something else that you might think of to help uh, Brockton become a more bike friendly and, and pedestrian friendly community? Yeah, so I, I drafted one of the ordinances that brought Rob May, the city planner, to Brockton. And he has been working with George Taranti from the state to talk about that. And if you look down Main Street right now, there's a bicycle path and on Belmont Street as well and West Elm Street. Um, you know, that's not my skill set, but I do know that the experts think that we can expand it throughout not just in the core of the city, north, south, east, west. We need to address it that way. Actually, it's gonna be a win-win for the youth as well because you know we get them out there. It happens in Boston, Rhode Island, Providence is key about that. So I don't have the answer to say, hey, we could do it this way. I would speak with the different people that are the experts that have done it in other municipalities. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, ladies and gentlemen. We can learn from other municipalities to benefit Brocktonians. Mr. Pereira, both questions. You want me to read the pre repeat yes. the first one? Um, go ahead, please. Sure. So traffic and road conditions are two areas of concern according to many motorists and who have traveled the city. What would your plan be to address these areas? So, so one minute for that. Thank you. Uh, my uh, uh, opponent mentioned about you know, the, the passing of Carl Yancey. We actually have invested uh, six, there's going to be a $6 million investment on uh, repairing uh, Belmont Street. Unfortunately, it's going to be in the same format that you see now, uh, which I think is uh, it's a disaster. It's wrong. Uh, we need to, again, make sure that we measure twice, cut once, because once you implement something into our community, it's there for a long time. Uh, we need to also update the pavement management system implement new practices, create a Brock 
Stockton Bicycle Pedestrian Livability Study to make sure that we look at how we're going to make those connections uh, because it's very intricate when you look at the network of the city of Brockton. It's a grid pattern, uh, but also looking at the old infrastructure underneath. We need a capital improvement plan. We need a livability study. We need an ADA transition plan, which we don't have, which is also mandated by the federal government, which can open us up to a liability uh, and litigation as well, uh, but also making sure, again, that we measure twice, cut once, because when you have situations like this, like Legion Parkway and the uh, accident there, you have detriment to the society of the city of Brockton. Thank you. Do you want to say anything about bike friendly and pedestrian friendly? Yes, uh, walkability is very important, again, for everyone, whether you be, you're the uh, age community, uh, those that are living in transit-oriented development close to the uh, commuter rail stations, uh, and also looking to have recreational or exercise uh, events take place in the city of Brockton. Uh, when we want festivals or events downtown, we want to make sure that it's safe, coordinated. We also look at the infrastructure, which is age. Your traffic lights, when you drive on home today, they're supposed to be overhead. So when we have new developments come into place, or new projects or dollars to fix these uh, intersections, we need to make sure that we're not putting back the same old, same old. That's not going to bring change and not going to be effective for the city of Brockton. By doing so, we will make sure that it's a bikeable, walkable, friendly community, which will help with housing values, and also help with crime and uh, uh, disparity that we see in the city of Brockton. Ms. Jaynes? Mr. Pereira, as mayor, what is your plan to reduce crime in the city? Specifically, can you discuss key areas that would make Brockton a safer place to live, work, and do business in? Yes. So we always want to make sure, and I hop on it over and over again, the multifaceted approach, knowing that it's not just one problem and it's not just one solution. Uh, we want to make sure that we create neighborhood associations and expand on those. We have a few now, the Village Park, uh, Keith Neighborhood Association, Edgar Park Neighborhood Association, Ash Street Park Neighborhood Association. And by outlining these uh, districts and uh, uh, neighborhoods, we're able to have community engagement uh, and liaison, and a, a communication a liaison between community members and government as well. Uh, we also want to focus on uh, workforce development and getting our at-risk youth uh, involved into uh, job training. Uh, right now, with the summer youth program, you kind of see them cleaning out the uh, shrubs and the uh, grass on the uh, streets. I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's adequate or equitable. We want our children to be future leaders, uh, CEOs, administrators, and people in f uh, positions that uh, close to the uh, issues that we see now in the city of Brockton. Uh, we need more cultural competency as well. Uh, when we look at mental health stability also, knowing that it's a diverse community that faces diverse issues. Uh, there's a family right now that uh, is looking to uh, uh, that has just came from Caver that are looking to uh, receive services, and uh, they have uh, families and are uh, sponsored as well. Uh, but the situation that was back there at home wasn't really good. So you have families coming over that are looking to make a new life here that bring the baggage and the issues that they have back at home as well. Uh, and you have families that are going through domestic issues, alcoholism now, uh, that are happening right here in the home of the city of Brockton. Uh, so again, we need to make sure that we strengthen communications, work with all the organizations as well, and make sure that the advocacy organizations are at the table. But make sure that government has a uh, response available for those that may uh, have need, uh, especially when we look at our school system as well. We need to educate our young uh, community on e emotional intelligence, uh, because when we have a community that doesn't talk about the issues, whether it be the mental issues, the uh, uh, personal issues that they have, uh, we are enclosed in our silos. And again, we need to open it up to make sure that we settle all the issues that we face. Mr. Sullivan? So we all want safer streets and reduce crime. That's what we want in Brockton. And as a councilor at large for 14 years, and as the council president and acting mayor, I've done that. I've appropriated funds to make sure that we have safer streets. The street spot, uh, short spotter on the, uh, on, the, on the telephone poles, the uh, license plate reader, these are facts that have done. We need to give the police tools in the toolbox. We also need to hire police, not just fill retired spots, but bring on new men and women that are going to be community policing. People say, how do you come up with the money? Well, we can cut some money from the overtime budget line, line item. I've done 14 budgets. I know that. That's a fact. Hire more people and then get the community policing. Get the walking beats. Working with our educators, too, because we're all in this together. The buy-in is there. We want a safe community. And crime is a reality. We're never going to mitigate it 100%, but we need to minimize that. And again, it goes back to our drug uh, uh, education process as well. So we all want a safe community, and I will say that if I'm elected mayor, I will continue that advocacy. It needs to happen. It also needs to happen all around the city of Brockton, not just walking beats downtown. I think that has some value and some merit, but we also need to make sure that the police 
have a relationship. When I was a kid growing up in Brockton, police officers would, would talk to you and need more open communication and dialogue. That needs to happen again. It needs to happen again. Next category is education. Mr. Lindy. So this question is for Robert Sullivan first. What is your view specifically of charter schools in Brockton and how do they affect our public school system? So uh, I have two kids that go to Brockton public schools and one goes to a Catholic parochial school. I understand people want to have options for education. I get that. Um, but I testified against a charter school because ultimately it takes money right away from our Chapter 70 funding. It hurts our public school system. When a student goes to a for-profit, such as Heights here in Brockton, it takes money away. If that student comes back to the Brockton public schools, that money doesn't follow the student. So I think there's this value in charter schools, absolutely. But I also think the Horace Mann, Horace Mann theory or the champion uh, is, is a better way to go. But when you're taking money away, and I'm a product, 1988, and my wife's 1989. When, when you're taking money away, when Brockton is not getting its fair share and its case law that says the Webby case, the McDuffie case, and the Hancock case says Brockton, a poorer community, is not being treated fairly from an economic standpoint. My sister is a teacher at the Brookfield School, second grade. There's almost 32 kids in the classroom. Not good for the boys and girls trying to learn, definitely not good for the teacher. We need to come together, Mark, to try to maximize our dollar amounts for public schools. And again, when I testified against it, it wasn't to say, hey, you can't send your kid to the charter school. You have that option. It's a financial ramification that is hampering the efforts of Brockton public school students right now, K through 12. Thank you. Mr. Pereira? Thank you, Mark. Uh, this is one of, one of the most, uh, any educational question is the, uh, one of the most important questions you'll be asking tonight. Uh, I'm raising two children in the Brockton Public School System. Uh, and this is uh, something that I grew up also uh, in under resource school district. So anything that depletes resources from our, our public school system is a detriment meant to me, to my family, and to the family of the city of Brockton. Uh, options are important, of course, but we need to make sure that it's not conflicting with what we want here in the city of Brockton and throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, I went to a Horace Mann school, so public schools are the foundation of Massachusetts and our country as well. Uh, since February, I've been advocating for the Mass Teachers Association legislation, uh, the Promise Act, uh, because our children's zip code should not never determine their access to quality public education. Uh, I've advocated for the uh, Promise Act, the Cherish Act, otherwise known as the uh, Fund Our Future campaign. I have been uh, at the State House and in community meetings for this legislation, and I believe together we'll be able to move the city forward. I support legislation proposed by State Rep. Jerry Cassidy and State uh, Claire Cornyn that would create a low-income student fund administered through the Department of Early and Secondary Education, allowing us to complete for additional, compete for additional grants that help fund social equity programs and also strengthening opportunities for our uh, community here in the city of Brockton. Thank you both. Mr. Roll. This question for Jimmy Prayer first. What's your stance on whether Brockton should file an equity and education lawsuit against the state, given recent progress on Beacon Hill to address this issue? I think we should still uh, pursue the uh, lawsuit. I don't want to just uh, resolve for the carrot on the stick. I want to make sure that we follow through thoroughly uh, at revamping the uh, formula and also making sure that we look at long-term uh, solutions and goals that would achieve uh, stability in our public education system here in the city of Brockton. Uh, we are at a disadvantage. I've talked to many students and also uh, college-bound uh, students that say that you know once they get on campus, I myself included, feel like they're at a disadvantage because they're, because they're competing with kids from different regions, different muni uh, communities that have a stronger education system there. Uh, we need to collaborate with uh, the uh, local uh, school systems here, such as uh, Massasoit and Bridgewater State, uh, so we can mo move forward with the, uh, uh, the uh, Grow Your Own uh, uh, policy and uh, initiative that's going forth with the uh, educational system now. Uh, I think when we are looking at our cultural competency and making sure students know uh, their value, they would prosper and go further and know their value, uh, their self-worth as well. Mr. Sullivan, uh, one minute to respond to that question, please. Yes, what I have done as a city council is the last budget I helped vote to appropriate $100,000. It's going to be put in a pool with other gateway communities 
to, to bring the action forward. It needs to happen. We have legal counsel right now that's going to do a pro se. They're not going to charge us. But it's the poorer, quote, poorer communities that are getting shortchanged, ladies and gentlemen. I met with Kathy Smith when she was superintendent. I met with Mike Thomas. We need to move forward. Now, there is some sentiment right now to do the right thing coming out of Beacon Hill. And it looks like it could be paid over 10 years. And it would be a substantial amount of money. But we're being cheated. Transportation reimbursement costs, we're not getting. And who does that shortchange? The boys and girls trying to learn in Brockton Public Schools. I'm going to be an advocate. I have for 14 years. I went to school with Robin Webby. She is the plaintiff named back in the day and the SJC said, yeah, Brockton, you're right. You're not getting your fair equity. You need to. So I'm going to support that. Everybody in here knows Brockton kids count. I had that on my lawn and that means something. Brockton kids count. So I would support that. Even if we get that windfall of money coming down the queue, which it may, that's fine, but they've shortchanged us over years. They need to do the right thing for Brockton kids. Dr. Cabello. Mr. Sullivan. What do you think are the top one or two needs that this Brockton public school system needs? And how would you address them? Well, I think you need to look at both internally and externally. Um, what, one thing is a lot of our buildings, especially Brockton High, the new Brockton High, which is going to be a half a century old this year, um, we need to and we have uh, put money aside that we're going to do phase reconstruction on that. But that's, that's bricks and mortar. I need to talk about the boys and girls trying to learn. We have a quality, quality, quality program, recognized just not in the Commonwealth, but countrywide. But we need to make sure that we have the teachers. Right now, when a teacher comes to Brockton that has student debt coming out of college, they're not coming to Brockton. They're going to Quincy or Boston because they're getting paid that much more. We need to figure out a revamp system, number one, that's going to take care of people. There was a Donovan program out of Boston College. That's why um, Sharon Walder came to Brockton, former principal of Brockton High. We need to create these collaborations. Bridgewater State College, the other day, initiated in-house at Brockton High School. That's a win for the students. But it comes down to dollars, doctor. It comes down to making sure Brockton's not getting shortchanged. Comes back to that lawsuit again. But we need to do kind of a holistic approach, look at everything. We need to make sure that we hire teachers that address the needs of students, that look like or speak like the students. You can't, you can't do preferential treatment or hiring, but you can have a roundtable discussion to say, what are the core elements right now? Why don't you want to come to Brockton? Potentially it could be because every budget cycle, a lot of the newer teachers are getting riffed. And they just can't afford to stick around to see if that budget's coming. They need to put their resumes out to see to get another job. That's a reality. What I did when I was the president back in 2008 is I said, let's do the budget early. And at that time, it was Mayor Jim Harrington. And I've served with the Harrington, Belzardi, the late Carpenter, and now Rodriguez. I said, let's do a budget early, ratify it so the rifts that are coming out can be revoked back, and we're going to keep the teachers. Once they are cemented in the system and they're helping the youth, it does a negative impact on the kid and the teacher professionally when they have to go elsewhere. We don't want to lose them. That's the skill. That's the future. So it, again, it's, it's, a, it's a complex issue, but we need to address it because it's for the youth. Thank you. Mr. Pereira, one minute. Can you repeat the question, please? Of course. What do you think are the top one or two needs are in Brockton Public Schools, and how would you address them? Great. I think uh, cultural competency is one of the uh, biggest needs in the city of Brockton in our uh, school system. Uh, also funding, of course, so not just going after the state to make sure we get our fair share, but also advocating for uh, uh, agreements in uh, legislative matters such as the Promise Act and the Cherish Act, uh, working with the parents as well too to educate them on uh, providing support to teachers as well, uh, and making sure that they're there when we need to advocate, we, when we need advocates for our students and our teachers. Uh, because of our diverse community, we have people that don't know about IEPs or aren't sure about uh, what it entails as well. So and that's where we want to make sure that everyone is educated on how to make sure that they know where their resources are and how to get help. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're looking at the uh, other legislative matters, as I mentioned earlier, uh, which State Rep uh, Jerry Cassidy and State Rep Claire Croning are working on also, uh, to make sure that we look at the long-term effects and how to bring uh, positive change to our school system. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. James. Mr. Pereira. In your opinion, what do you believe are the top concerns of this, the, to the needs of college students in Brockton? Jobs, for one. Uh, fortunately for me, I, you know, 
my first job was working for the Enterprise as a uh, newspaper subscriber. I uh, went to doors and you know asked for everyone to whether they wanted to subscribe for uh, news for, for the newspaper article. Uh, before graduating college, I already worked for Commonwealth Corporation, which is a quasi nonprofit organization that helps fund uh, at risk youth uh, opportunities such as the bridging opportunity gap. Um, <clears throat> we need more uh, opportunities for our students that uh, are from Brockton, that have left, gone to college, and are looking for jobs uh, and want to come back to the city of Brockton, but there isn't any opportunity. Uh, when you are looking for a job, they usually want you to have, uh, right out the door, 15 years of experience uh, supervising a, uh, and working with a budget of uh, 100,000 uh, or uh, 500 uh, million. Uh, so we need to make sure that we're looking at how, again, that our uh, students are, when they're leaving Brockton, aren't disenfranchised or are at a disadvantage, and also make sure that we're offering opportunities for them to grow. Uh, that's why when we work at, when we look at the summer youth program for children that are transitioning from 16 and older, uh, and that they're ready for the workforce. That's how I was ready uh, when I uh, left college. That's how I was ready when I left Springfield after working uh, at City Hall there uh, and with the other departments as well. Uh, and also through my youth, I've been in those summer youth programs where you know we were out there painting fire hydrants and doing benign things, but I took the initiative to ask the foreman, ask the administrator, what did they have to do to go to college? Why did they dress in a suit and tie? And how do you uh, do a, a, a tie a tie? Uh, and what do you do when you get into the workforce? What do you do when you're sitting at the interview? I've been involved in the interview process where I'm asking the questions and also been on the other side, of course, where I've been asked the questions. Uh, so again, we need to prepare our children, uh, we need to prepare our teenagers, and we need to prepare our college students and graduates that are looking to come back to the city of Brockton. That's why I want to educate for it down, uh, that's why I want to campaign and uh, uh, advocate for a downtown education collaborative and the Grow Your Own uh, plan for the uh, students, but also a Brockton buyback program for student teachers and those that want to come back to the city of Brockton and work in our school system as well. Mr. Sullivan? I think in this day and age, uh, probably the number one concern for college students is cost and tuition and debt. Uh, when I went to Boston College, I mean, I didn't grow up wealthy in Brockton. My dad was a teacher, my mom was a nurse. I flipped burgers to get through college, and I came out with a lot of substantial debt. I think we need to uh, open up the opportunities. We need to also open up the internship programs here in the city of Brockton. The number one asset in Brockton are the people, and we have great skills here in Brockton, but we need to enhance those skills. We have health care, we have education, we have law, we have banking. We need to maximize our students so that they stay in Brockton, but also that they have an opportunity when they graduate and they get that piece of paper that they can go into the workforce, make some money, because most Brockton college students are having debt when they come out. That's a reality. I had it, my wife had it. So I think at the end of the day, we as a collective community need to say, listen, we understand what you're going through. You know, there's certain work off programs that we can consider. And that would go back to the ordinance, the legislative body. Maybe we have Brockton people that stay in Brockton, work in Brockton, get a price reduction. Right now, if you come out and you graduate and you volunteer as a teacher uh, at Trinity Catholic Academy here in Brockton, you get a price reduction. If you stay there for five years, it's frozen, it's gone, it's wiped out. These are the things we need to do and be creative about it collectively. So we're gonna circle back to category of leadership and qualifications. <clears throat> Um, each of you will have a minute to answer this question. First, Mr. Sullivan, of all the issues discussed this evening and others you may have encountered during the campaign, if you were elected mayor, what would be your top three priorities on day one? Well, I think, you know, when I'm knocking on doors, people have different ideas. You know, if it's a young family, it's public education. Uh, you know, seniors, uh, it's safety. Um, economic viability and building our tax base is extremely important in Brockton. We need to make sure that the $150 million invested downtown in 2019 continues. And the only way to continue to do that is to continue to build a relationship with the investors. So we can talk about hiring more cops and trying to make sure it's safe the community or making sure code enforcement's enhanced and it needs to be. Perception's reality, it doesn't look clean the city right now, but I think at the end of the day, it's kind of a collaborative approach. And we need to, the number three would be education, making sure we have a safe community, making sure the economic viability and the investment happens. We're a gateway city, we're only 35 minutes from Boston, and we're ripe. That's what I went to the summit today, that's what they expressed to me, we're ripe for that. The mayor needs to be the leader, the CEO of the business, and I hope to do that. With my experience at 40 years on the council, I have that from day one. There's no learning curve to be mayor. You need to be effective on day one. Mr. Pereira? Yes, thank you. For me, the trial, uh, 
again, it's a multifaceted approach. There are a list of issues that we face, but they're all interconnected. So we need to focus on, of course, public safety as a priority, uh, whether you're looking at gun violence, mental health, uh, substance abuse, or even transportation conflicts and accidents where people are, again, uh, getting ran over or cars are driving into buildings. Uh, we also want to make sure that economic development is a priority, but the most important thing for me is public education. Raising two children, and again, being myself a, a product of our Brockton public school systems, but also falling through the cracks, whether uh, the uh, number of schools that I went to, uh, Davis, Huntington, Raymond, North Chia High, and also the alternative school, uh, Phoenix, B.B. Russell, which is now uh, the uh, Frederick Douglass Academy and also the Champion High School. Uh, we need to make sure that we're looking at all these issues and how it affects the society in the city of Brockton. Everything is interconnected, interlinked. Uh, we need to look at the multifaceted approach. And if and uh, when elected, I would make sure to open the door uh, and make sure that we're educating the community on how to get involved, sitting with the stakeholders, whether it be uh, the community members, uh, organizations, and of course, uh, local municipality uh, department heads and state delegation and also the federal government to make sure that we're looking at the issues and how to resolve uh, the uh, multiple uh, things that we see in the city of Brockton. So in this next section, um, first, uh, Mr. Pereira, you'll ask Mr. Sullivan a question and Mr. Sullivan will answer that question and then you can have a follow-up discussion. Thank you for this opportunity uh, and uh, opportunity to ask uh, my opponent a question. Uh, in 2015 and in 2017, uh, there were desperate cries for changing the community and the leadership as well. Uh, I ran in 2017 against the late Mayor Carpenter when he was at his strongest. I want to know why would you wait uh, when he was at his weakest point uh, and his passing to run for mayor when we desperately need a change? Good question, Jimmy. Um, for 10 years, uh, I've served 14 years. For the last 10 years, I've been asked by Brockton residents to run for mayor. And my answer was this, family first, my young, my young family. When I first got elected, I had no kids. I have three now. Um, I've been having listening sessions since February. I had intentions to run for mayor, and you can confirm with my wife on that. Um, at the end of the day, it's not taking advantage of someone's death. It's stepping up to the plate saying, for 14 years, I've been a productive city councilor, a councilor at large, a president of a council, an acting mayor, and I have the experience. Right now, Brockton is here. We need to go there. We can't afford to go there, Jimmy. We need to have experience on day one. Good question. Thank you. you want to follow up? You're welcome to follow up. <clears throat> yes, uh, I am also a father to children, uh, but I have a strong sense of urgency and a strong fire to bring change to the city of Brockton. Uh, and I think, again, when you see the change uh, and you see the need, I think you need to run towards that fire and go put it out and bring change uh, and stability to the city of Brockton, which we desperately need. Uh, 14 years of the same old, same old, uh, that's more than enough time to get engaged. Uh, and again, uh, we desperately need a change. Uh, and I think now it's time to uh, elect that change come November 5th. Any final follow-up comments? Yeah, I mean, if you know me, it's not same old, same old. I've been banging the drum for many, many years to do the right thing and speaking out against people. What's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. When I stepped up to the plate and said, hey, let's adopt Chapter 40 R Smart Growth Zoning, people said no. When I said, let's buy the streetlights for 42,000, people said no. It saved 550 the first year, 600,000. I am a guy that's trying to do the right thing. I'm not the old boy. I know you keep saying this, same old, same old, but I'm someone that's gonna work for Brockton people. I'm one of you, I wanna work with you, I wanna work for you, I wanna be your next mayor. Mr. Sullivan, would you like to ask a question to Mr. Pereira? I would, and I, I do also want to say that Jimmy and I have run a professional, polite, courteous campaign. I want to thank each and all of you. It doesn't always happen that way, so thank you. My, my question to Jimmy would be as follows. Um, it's great that you have a planning experience, but there's a municipal finance experience that I'm not sure you have. It's the mayor's budget. So what I'm asking you right now, Jimmy, is do you believe that the position of mayor is a job that can be conducted with on-the-job training? Uh, I do, because that's what the late Mayor Carpenter did, and look at where we are now. Uh, you continue. <laughs> You continue to uh, say that you know you want to move that train forward, but again, there was a lot of obstruction from uh, you know the legislative body that didn't really move the city forward, uh, and that's why again, with that sense of urgency, I want to continue to take that train forward. Uh, and again, we have over 600 million dollars of uh, projects coming down the South Coast Rail expansion. We need to make sure that Broughton gets some of those dollars. 54 million dollars are going to be worked on the bridges. We have more than three bridges uh, that carry that train over. Again, my experience 
is experience that matters. Uh, my experience, which you might have heard that from other candidates, uh, which share the same sentiment as myself, uh, that Carpenter didn't have the experience as mayor. He went in there and he learned and he listened and opened that door. That's what I will continue to do and that's why I ran against him in 2017 because I still see room for improvement and then again, that sense of urgency and that fire that burns within me is a fire that burns within the city of Brockton, also the city of champions. Thank you. So, so that's actually, that's actually factually incorrect, ladies and gentlemen. Bill Carpenter served four years on the school committee. He was duly elected as a school committee member. And he also had the experience of collective bargaining, sitting at the table, working with the mayor on a school budget. So that was not factually accurate. What I will say is experience does matter. There's no learning curve. And on day one, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected your mayor, I'm going to have the background, the skill set, the collaboration, the working relationship, the financial ability to move Brockton forward for all of us. Because this election is not about me. It's about all of us together. Thank you. So we come to closing remarks. Am I supposed to say something to that uh, uh, rebuttal, as he did before? Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Again, uh, mentioning the uh, obstruction that was put in place of the uh, late Mayor Carpenter, uh, I also have a, a res uh, experience working with a budget. Uh, when you look at the Transportation Improvement Program, there's over, at any year, over $20 million where we disseminate it to the 17 communities. Brockton is one of those communities. $6 million is, again, going on to Belmont Street, uh, which, again, is the same old, same old, which we need to change. Someone died there. We need to implement innovative practices, uh, something that, you know, for 14 years we haven't seen. Uh, something else that we need to change also is the uh, Plymouth and uh, Center Street intersection, which is right next to the Pluff Academy. There's $1.7 million allocated for that project, but it won't start till 2023. Again, God forbid a child gets hit, which we did have an incident where the crossing guard was almost hit on that intersection. Uh, we need to make sure that we elect someone that's going to bring innovative change, that's not going to wait for the right moment to move things forward, and if that project or initiative doesn't work, we need a follow-up plan. We didn't see that with the ordinances. There was a mor uh, moratorium that was put in place for the uh, uh, recreational marijuana that really appealed and uh, obstructed a lot of the uh, revenues that we could have received. Uh, we also seen that there's not any innovative mentions of any other uh, initiative that's taking place in the state that will be coming down the pipeline. Uh, again, at the JTC meeting, which is the Joint, Joint Transportation Committee meeting, we've had an absent seat where the mayor has not sat in that seat to advocate for the dollars to come to the city. Uh, and it's not just the mayor. Our counselors can go there as well. And I haven't seen any of the counselors there other than uh, when there's an issue in their, in their ward. We need representation, and we need it now. On November 5th, I hope to have you vote and make change here in the city of Brockton. Thank you. So now we come to a time for <laughs> closing statements, starting with Mr. Sullivan. Again, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. You don't have to be here. You choose to be here, and that's exciting for Brockton's future. You're engaged. You're concerned. You're doing your homework, and I respect that. If you don't vote for me, I respect you going to the polls. On November 5th, I'm encouraging you to consider me. My website is electrobertsullivan.com. What you see is what you get with me. I'm trying to make a difference in Brockton. In over 14 years as a counselor at large, going to City Hall every Monday night, I do my homework, I'm vocal, I bang the drum, and that's what I want to do, to be the CEO. With my business degree and my law degree, I have the skills and the experience to move Brockton forward for all of us, collectively, inclusively. Someone said to me the other day, well, you're 49 and you're white. And I said, you know what, I can't change my age, can't change my color, but I'm a Brockton guy, and I want to make a difference for Brockton. I want to make a difference for Brockton. And I just, I just think that right now, we have such a crucial time in Brockton, and we need to have the right people to be our leaders, our voice. And that's why, humbly, I'm asking for your consideration and your vote on November 5th. We, it's just too precious not to get it right. Nothing you know, disrespect for Jimmy, and I like Jimmy as a person, but I don't know what plan he has other than he's a planner. I have a plan, but I also have proven record, accomplishments, things that make a difference on a daily basis, investing money in Brockton, making sure we protect our citizens, making sure that at all times you feel on Monday night when you're watching on TV, hey, Bob Sullivan, Councilor Lodge, He's one of the guys that's helping. I'm not part of the Old Boys Network, and I'll tell you a quick story. In 2005, people told me, don't waste your time. You can't win. You can't win. You're not part of the clique. You know what? It was me and my father knocking on doors, and we won. That's what it means, doing it for the right reason. 
and that's why I'm running for mayor. And people can say, well, you're taking advantage of a death. That's factually inaccurate. I'm taking advantage of our community. We need to move forward together to make sure that we have a safe community, a thriving community, and a community that people don't laugh at Brockton. Brockton is a city of champions. You're all champions, and I just want to be part of the team. I want to lead this team as we move forward. And I'm asking you on November 5th to please vote for me. I'm number two on the ballot, but I'm always number one for Brockton. Thank you. Mr. Pereira. Thank you. I want to again thank the moderators of this great debate, uh, BAMSI, Enterprise, uh, and our, uh, of course our other officials, uh, and also again thank you Sullivan uh, for running for office. Uh, this is what it's all about, uh, giving information to the residents of the city in a transparent and open process. I ran for mayor in 2017 for the same reason I stand before you today in 2019. I love the city, I love Brocktonians, and I love our story of perseverance and resilience. We truly are the city of champions. I pledge to you that no one will fight harder for your family than I will. I have had to fight my whole life to get a seat at the table, and that is a fight that I would bring to City Hall for you. The late Mayor Carpenter was a radio show host, a health officer, a boxing ring announcer, amongst other things, but he made sure to have informed leadership, and we're going to make sure to tackle the same issues that we've seen back then. He ran towards the fire where no one else would, and that is what we need to continue to do. That is what I will continue to do. To all the young people watching tonight, I want you to know confidently that you do not have to be an elite corporate lawyer to run for office or make change in the community. We are a city of hardworking people that deserve someone in office who understands what they are going through. Not because they read about it in a book, but because they've lived it day in and day out. And to our diverse community, whether they're Cavertian, Haitian, Lithuanian ascendants, Irish, Italian, understand that I'm here to work for you. We are one Brockton. We are a one strong Brockton. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. It doesn't matter if you're gay or straight. It doesn't matter what your religion are. Just know that I'm not just a planner. I am a father. I'm a future husband. I am an advocate for all those that have not had a voice at the table. It is time for change. The change that we need, the change that we deserve. Brockton. I am ready to make change. The question is, are you ready to make change? So on November 5th, please stand up, rise up, and let's win. Win for the city of Brockton because it's time. We desperately need to move the city forward, and we need that same sense of urgency that we had later in the years, 2017, 2019, and God willing, on 2020, I will be your next mayor. Thank you for your time, and I humbly ask for your vote November 5th. Thank you. So we've come to the end of our debate. Let's uh, give our candidates a round of applause again. And will you, will you thank our panelists? I want to also thank the hosts of this debate, um, the Brockton Enterprise, BAMSI, Massasoit, and Brockton Community Access. And I want to thank those watching at home and all of you here. You've been a great audience. And uh, remember to vote on Tuesday, November 5th.